everybody we're live. <laughs> hello, hello. I am joined tonight by Buffalo and further reading. Hello. How is everybody doing? And thank you very much to Hell the Lich King for your raid. <laughs> Uh, so yes, we are going to be covering how to keep your fortress safe. Um, but first of all, let's do some introductions. A further reading, you are our experienced player for tonight. And uh, would you like to tell people where they can find you on the internet? And uh, how long you've been playing Dwarf Fortress, all of that sort of thing. Yeah, sure. So you can find me on YouTube and on uh, Twitch. I am uh, at Further Reading TV on YouTube and I'm Further Reading on Twitch. Um, in terms of my experience with Dwarf Fortress, um, I've only been playing it about a year, but I've been aware and following it for much longer. Um, I I think I first discovered it on the, the, the Bolt Murdered Let's Play back on Something Awful. Back, oh, yeah. I'd say it's like 10, 10 plus years now at this stage. Uh, but yeah, that, that was that was when I first discovered it, um, and I've been following it ever since then. Uh, back at my old job, I had lots of quiet night shifts, and uh, I spent them watching tons of Crook Smash videos. Um, and for years, I wanted to play, but I felt a bit intimidated by the, um, the all the ASCII and the, the bad UX and stuff. But uh, about a year ago, I decided to bite the bullet and give it a go, and I found that once I got past that, it was a really, really fun game, and it wasn't as difficult as I was expecting it to be. And I've, I've, just, I've just been having a blast with it. And uh, now that the Steam release is out and everything is even easier to play and uh, easier to visualize, I've been having an absolute blast with the game. <laughs> yeah, at first, um, especially with Classic, with the, the old user interface, um, especially if you tried it in ASCII graphics as well, there was a bit of a learning curve just to get to the game in the first place, I found. Um, but uh, yeah, once you get... Once you got past that in the olden days, it was um, it was worth it. And um, like you say, now it's just so much easier. Th that initial barrier isn't there. Now it's just about learning how to play. And Lou, would you like to introduce yourself? Tell people where they can find you and tell us about your experience with Dwarf Fortress so far. You're pretty new to the game, I believe. Uh I'm very new to the game. Uh, so I'm Buffalo. Uh, I'm primarily on YouTube. I do video essays about all sorts of games. Uh, I got my start through trying to make my own game, and uh, I did a video essay on uh, Ultra Kill, and that actually blew up more than any of my other devlogs that I was doing. So I switched over to doing primarily video essays, and I did a video on story generators uh, and used Dwarf Fortress as kind of like the main example of what a story generator was and that video blew up so uh i've been getting back into the game recently my experience is primarily back in around 2013 2014 uh, i saw quill 18 playing the game uh, using the lazy noob pack uh, which had like dwarf therapist df hack uh, a few other things in it, and it actually had a tile set to bypass the ascii graphics entirely uh back then and i, I had played that for a few months uh, but eventually I put the game down in favor of other games like uh, RimWorld and other things that were just a bit easier to play. But with the Steam release, uh, I'm actually trying to get back into it. And uh, I have a single fortress going right now that's uh, a couple of years in. And uh, it actually ended up starting kind of with a skull-cracking start. Uh, my woodcutter ended up chopping down like his second tree like, we had just arrived, chopped down a second tree, and it fell on him. So I had to learn all about how to set up a hospital and fix broken bones and stuff like oh, that. Dear. So, yeah. So that's where I'm at right now. But uh, <laughs> he, he did live, and uh, now the fortress is a couple years on, and uh, he's going strong. So, And you're making a, a Let's Play video out of that, I believe? Yeah. Uh, so my plan is where my story generator video didn't really have a story from Dwarf Fortress, I'm going to put out a new video about this fortress I'm doing right now uh, to actually give a proper example of a Dwarf Fortress story. Yeah, yeah. That way, that way people can see that example. Because yeah. I didn't really have that before. 
<laughs> and uh, so let's get into today. Oh, and I should say about stories. So on a Saturday, I usually try to prepare a, uh, a story from Dwarf Fortress. Um, I haven't got one today. I'm saving that one for Monday because I think we'll have more time on Monday um, for a story. And I've had an offer. Um, Packrat uh, from the Minecraft Minecraft fame <laughs> has offered to, uh, if anybody want, finds a story within Dwarf Fortress and you would like your story read out on stream, he would um, he is happy to voice it over for you. Uh, so yes, that, that offer goes out to chat and to everybody. Uh, if you've got a Dwarf Fortress story and you'd like it to be read out by Packrat, then uh, yeah, send your story through to me. The easiest way is to put it on, um, is to write it up on the Dwarf Fortress subreddit and to tag me so I can see it. Um, we shall get Packrat to read it out because he's he's got such an awesome doom laden voice. <laughs> That'd be cool. Uh, right, let's uh, but let's get into this. So today we're looking at how to protect your fortress, and we're starting with this fortress that I've got here. So we're looking at my screen at the moment. And for those of you who in chat who have been around for some time, you this fortress might become familiar. This was the very first fortress that I did on the Kit Fox streams. Uh, we did it as a tutorial fortress, uh, a play along with Sal where we worked through the uh, the tutorial, uh, the in-game tutorial. And I thought we'd have a quick look at the most basic, the earliest of defences. So this was a way to keep everybody safe, ish, <laughs> almost everybody, and pretty safe within about two weeks of arriving. So by the time you hit the second month of spring, you can, you've got a way to keep yourself extremely safe. And it's to do with hatch covers and how hatch covers work. So there are a number of monsters, enemies, uh, who can break hatch covers. And, but they can only break hatch covers that are below their feet. They can't break hatch covers that are above their head. So in the very start of a fortress, what I'll do is I'll sink a staircase down. Um, this particular one's a bit weird because we only had this little patch of growing area. There wasn't much that I could do for... We didn't have much, um, much soil in this place. Um, but yeah, otherwise, if we go down, then you see this staircase then ends there's a corridor that goes across and then there's a staircase that goes up uh, with hatch covers across the top. Now if I lock those hatch covers there's no way into the fortress anymore and anything that is capable, of course we've got a dwarf outside, but anything that was would be capable of breaking a hatch cover can't break these ones because they're above their head so as a very early way to turtle uh, i best open this so that the guy outside can get in so yeah the very earliest way to turtle i will dig down uh, from the surface so the hatch covers outside aren't strictly necessary but if we get sieged by somebody or attacked by something, even if it's just dangerous wild animals that um, come onto the map, I, if they are not capable of destroying a building, I can just lock the hatch covers on the surface. And that means that they can't get down to my dogs. 
and I've still got access then to the wood in the corridor here as well. And plus then we can let Solon get back into the fortress. But uh, if we get attacked by something like an ogre, and uh, speaking of ogres, further reading, you you noticed something about the building destroyers. Do you, do you want to just explain that? Yeah, so there's been a known bug since the Steam release that building or that are uh, building destroyers generally aren't blowing up doors and hatches and stuff. But uh, yesterday, when I was playing my current fort. Um, I was attacked by goblins that had ogres uh, in their in their group, and those ogres were happily destroying all my hatches and doors. Um, I was a bit surprised because I, I got so used to them not blowing up hatches and doors that I kind of got a bit lazy and then like put my bridges and stuff up to properly defend them and suddenly i had a bunch of uh, ogres and goblins in my base and i almost lost it so uh <laughs> yeah it turns out that there, there, there was currently one exception to that issue at the moment <laughs> yeah i've uh, i always assume well i'm kind of i'm ready to be caught out <laughs> by by that bug being fixed at the most inappropriate time for me <laughs> so i uh, um my fortresses when i design them i assume that there's a building destroyer out there somewhere who can get through our stuff what have you found with weird beasts do you find that weird beasts um are at the moment are unable to break down doors uh, i've been very lucky actually because i haven't had a big weird beast problem i fought so far um, as far as I know, they're not breaking down doors, but uh, yeah, I haven't actually seen seen them yet in my in my fortresses. Yeah, I've been I've got a fortress at the moment with three weird beasts in, and they're all locked behind doors, but are walled in because <laughs> I'm I'm not prepared to test it because <laughs> uh, weird beasts running around your fortress is um, well, bit of a recipe for disaster. Um, so yes, this is the, the most basic way to make sure, and a very quick and easy way to make sure that your fortress can stay safe at the start. Um, the hatch covers are made at a stonemason's workshop, oh, which I've moved downstairs. Uh, this gap here used to have a stonemason, so when I start a fortress, I dig this, I call it the U-Bend design. Uh, where we just go down, go across, go up. Then I dig out a storage area, I put down a stonemason and immediately make two hatch covers for the hatch covers that are inside the fortress, for the, hatch, uh, for the staircases that come into the fortress. And that will keep your fortress safe from pretty much anything. So that's the, the most basic, and on this fortress, I've got no other save, because this is really early. This was um, uh, midsummer, so they've been here for a season. Um, but yeah, very, very early. The trade depot is still outside. Uh, we've got the animals that pulled the, uh, the wagon. They're still outside, so... There's still stuff on the surface that is vulnerable. And of course our dwarfs are popping in and out of the fortress as well. So they're still vulnerable. But at least we can call people inside if we need to. And to call people inside, the easiest way to do that would be to set up a burrow. So if we add new burrows and we'll just paste over it and say, yep. Uh, as long as the, as long as we cover the food, and then we'll call that burrow. Oops. Indoors. We'll say don't use the workshops that are outside the burrow. And then if we add everybody, and anybody who's in the military, um, we'll tell them they need to come to the burrow. And they're not allowed out of the burrow. Now, they if they're doing something, they will finish the job that they're doing and then they'll head to the burrow. So it's a it's not a fast way to get people inside. Um but you can use it to prevent people from going 
to places which are dangerous. Uh, we would then extend that burrow. Because uh, we can have the burrow that covering multiple Z levels. As long as it doesn't cover the area that connects to the U-Bend. We'll have that come over here as well. Now let's zoom out a little bit. And you can paint the burrow over... over areas that you haven't dug, unlike stockpiles and zones and things. Uh, that way we can include areas where we plan to dig, but we haven't dug yet. I, I've got an area up here. There we go. So that burrow now has everybody assigned to it. And nobody should leave. So Solon should be making his way in Zors. I think he's carrying some wood or something. Yeah, you can see how slow they move when uh, when they're carrying something heavy. Uh, what is it that you're carrying, by the way? Oh, a lump of clay stone. Yeah, he's got a lump of rock. So he's made his way up through the hatch cover. And then in this corridor here, you'll see I've got some dogs. And the dogs are there to keep an eye out for thieves. They will also deter, or at least if we get ambushed by something, there are some enemies that can creep up on you. Is that a stray donkey? Huh, that donkey's ours as well. And the rabbit. Must have been somebody brought them in a migrant wave. I think. Oh no, they must have come with us on the embark. Yeah, it was a tutorial. We did the uh, the quick start. So we obviously brought a, a rabbit and a donkey as well. But yeah, there are some enemies can creep up on you and you won't know anything about it. The dogs in the corridor will alert us. And... They will also, if we get attacked, they can just give us a little bit of time to get the hatch covers locked. But if somebody come in on the edge of the map and we wanted to get the dogs in quickly, the hatch covers are open. What we would do is to go to the pen pasture and just suspend it. And now the dogs will just run inside. Usually. Usually pretty quickly. Dogs? Oh, there we go. There they go. <laughs> so the dogs are faster than anything else. They're usually pretty quick at getting indoors. Have we got a meeting area here for them? There's a pen pasture there. Um, maybe I don't have a meeting area in this fortress at the moment. That's a weaponsmith's guild. That's a dining room. Let's put down a generic meeting area. That should call them in. I've got a feeling this dog just doesn't know where he's supposed to go. Yeah, there's that dog. He's gone to the meeting area. Is there something wrong with you? Can you move? Yeah, you're healthy. Hmm. I use dogs specifically because... Oh, there we go. About time to... There he too. goes. <laughs> Indeed. Just confused. Um, dogs are one of the faster moving creatures. And usually the moment you suspend their... Uh, their pen pasture they dash straight for for the nearest meeting area okay so with those locked on the outside that means that wild animals and things can't get in these ones on the inside means that building destroyers can't get in um but let's unlock those again 
And now if I go to the dog zone and unsuspend that, someone will come and bring those dogs back to here. Uh, except I've still got the burrow active. So if I now suspend the burrow, the dwarfs are allowed back outside again. They'll only come into this corridor because those hatch covers are locked. But yeah, this little U-Bend design is the quickest and easiest way to make sure that, especially if you're going into an evil area, something like that, um, it just makes sure that you can get safe very quickly. So that's a really basic design. Uh, we're going to go over to further reading now. And further reading is going to give us a fortress tour of his fortress. And then we'll, uh, I'm going to load up a different fortress in the background. Um, actually, I'll just quit out of this one. And I can get the other fortress loading while uh, while we go over to further reading. And uh, it actually looks like we got a raid from Calm Cody too. Oh, Calm Cody, thank you so much for the raid. Hello, hello, welcome on in, raiders. All right, let's. Uh... Ah, I can't move you over there while you're working. Right, well, I can get this loaded up. Plane of Dawning. Yep, that's where we want to go. Right, while that loads, let's switch over. We shall bring you over here. Okay, further reading. Would you like to show us your fortress? Okay. You're on so, the screen. Um... Oh, awesome. So uh, here we are in our Vase Bells. It's a Joyce Wild Jungle. And in the middle of the jungle, we have this lone tower. And this is the entrance to my base. Um, kind of like what Sal did. I've got a dog. But my dog is chained up in this tower. So then um, uh, he can look out and see enemies that are sneaking in. Uh, they'll come in this way. Usually the way that the enemies tend to attack me in this map is they always come here from the east side. So they come over here. And the way I got this road set up is um, the enemies will always try to follow the shortest path while our wagons will avoid traps. So as the enemies come in, they're going to come up this way and they get caught in all these cage uh, traps while any wagons will keep going around and get down here. Uh-huh. And why? Just curious. I've never seen a blue biome before. What did you say the biome was? It's our joyous wilds. Uh, ah. So, yeah. So Joyce Wilds would be the most savage version of a good biome. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then it's also for terrifying biomes. Uh, they'll have, I think it's purple and brown, and they also have like eyeballs and stuff going off. The yeah, ground. It's yeah. Pretty awesome, yeah. But yeah, this this is the the, the good version of that. It's it's it's, uh, it's very pretty. Um, you mentioned actually Buffalo about losing a dwarf really early. I'm just going to show you down here. We have a skeleton. Uh, this was my expedition leader. Oh, uh, he decided. Uh, he just decided to jump off the, the cliff one day. It was really hard. Just randomly decided to jump off into the cliff. And, oh um, well. Yeah, and I've got like I think two or three different artifacts that just are about him and about him dying. My dwarves are obsessed with him for some reason. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, that was that was our early death. But uh, back anyway to the tour. So um, this cavern's actually pretty deep under the ground. It's a um, I have it placed below the first cavern layer. So we have this big tunnel to get down from the surface. So we keep on heading down and down and down. Uh -huh. And uh, this area is pretty exciting. Um, so uh, this is part of my defenses where if they keep going here to the left, this brings them to my trade depot. And I currently have this bridge closed. Um, this brings them to what we're calling the hell corridor on my, on my stream right now. Uh, which is a corridor that's full of these upright spears. And uh, these spears are connected to these pressure plates. So when an enemy steps on the pressure plate, the spears will go down. And when they step on it again, they'll go back up. <laughs> so as the enemy comes through here, they end up killing all their friends. Uh, it's pretty, <laughs> it's 
<laughs> pretty savage. Um, this won't work on our trap avoid creatures, I believe. Mm -hmm. But you can set these up to like uh, levers in your base or pressure pads in your base that your own dwarves or your own animals are stepping on. And then it can just be odd magling up and down all the time. Well, this one is a bit more cruel because I have them killing their friends instead. But this is like an <laughs> alternate way down. Um, uh, well, friendly people will keep going down here to the left. So I'll keep going down again. Uh -huh. Again, here we go down below the cavern layer. And we end up here in our big trade depot. Trade we depot. actually have, I think we've got three caravans here at the moment. Uh, yeah, we've got three dwarven caravans oh. coming to visit us. Uh, Oh, wow. We've got the training going on here. Um, over here is our dungeon area, which never really gets used. Um, I don't have my tavern open to the public, so not much fights happen and not much of the villain stuff happens. Uh, and that's also like a, a good way to keep yourself safe is to just have less stuff open to the public and yeah. then there's less villains trying to cause problems for you. Oh, and I just want to thank Napsa for the raid. Welcome on in, raiders. Nice one. Um... So this is like my main industrial area, which is uh -huh. very boring looking. I always have trouble trying to make my industrial area look look really pretty. It tends just to be very functional with just a bunch of big stockpiles, a couple of little quantum stockpiles uh -huh. here and there. Um, if we head up, we head to our social area. I've got my guilds. We've got my temples over here. We've got a nice big tavern up here. Mm -hmm. And um, a trick I learned off of Reddit the other day is you can put your barracks inside of your tavern. And then as your dwarves are training, uh, they'll be watching people, um, uh, let's see, uh, look, this, this guy doesn't see anything, but sometimes they'll be watching people like, say, po uh, like, tweet poetry or uh, entertain and stuff. Yeah, they'll, they'll, they'll watch that and they get happy memories as they're training, which is pretty cool. Yeah. Um, we also discovered that, uh, and we found this out on the last um, Saturday night stream, is that you can... If you set your tavern up as a dining room and then add the dining room uh, as a meeting area, which is also a tavern, you can have a dining tavern <laughs> and you can put your barracks within that as well. Yeah, so that's you actually can how double I have a whole, done. Lo whole lot of stuff yeah. up. So this area is a meeting hall. Mm hmm. This outer area, so that's the, that's the pasture. This outer area is the dining hall mm -hmm. that has the, the tables and chairs, and then the pastures and the wall actually added into the um, uh, the wall added into the tavern. So even though <laughs> I've got a bulk, um, the, even though the wall separate zones, they're, they're, they're all the, the 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 same single tavern zone. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, if we keep heading up here, we get to my living area. So my dwarves live in these lovely two by two. Little apartment uh -huh. with some nice, uh, nice places for my nobles. Um, we've got our graveyard over here where everyone has their own little little tomb room. Uh -huh. A bunch of tombs as well for my uh, my nobles. I uh, love the I love the white floors. What are you using uh, for those white floors? Oh, platinum. Oh, yeah, that's platinum. <laughs> so I actually, yeah, I, I have a video on my YouTube about this. But in terms of adding value to a room. Uh, platinum is a really good, it's it, it really high uh, value item. And then if you get it engraved with a high level engraver, it, you can very quickly get to the uh, the thresholds you need to make a, a, a high value room. So having, uh, I think, I, I can't remember the numbers off the top of my head, but I think if you have a, like a, um, um, a legendary engraver, uh, somewhere between two and five tiles of engraved platinum is all you need to get to the max value. Wow. Uh, down here is where we have our uh, our duke living. This is Voicraft, our duke. Uh -huh. uh, they've been living here. And then over here is where the king lives. Uh, the king has his throne room overlooking our our lava our lava pit, where we throw our prisoners down when we're done interrogating them or <laughs> stripping them. So as he's holding court, uh, bodies will fall down behind him. It's, this is just a very, a very grim fortress. <laughs> uh, Chat we... seemed to like it. <laughs> yeah, uh, if we keep heading up, we get to, this is kind of the entrance area. So we got my hospital over here, mm -hmm. all my kitchen and cooking stuff, uh, lots of food. We got, we got a lot of food. We, uh, we use the food for trading. Um, I think this is where I make my soap. I use oil for making my soap. Mm -hmm. And then we have a big cloud of animals here. This is like my last line of defense in case anything gets through everything else. 
So you got some giant dingoes and hyenas and some tigers and stuff. It's a very, a big, a big menagerie over here. <laughs> uh, and then this is where we have our prisoners ready, ready to be pit. So we have a bunch of goblins and uh, some ant men and stuff just ready to get stripped off and shown into the, uh, the lava. And you've got some of those in terrariums? Yes. So I like making terrariums. Uh, that's the green glass version of a cage. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I, I say, uh, uh, and uh, it's um, all, all of the glass cages are called terrariums. Um, a uh, fun thing you do with terrariums is uh, if you build them somewhere, you can set them to be a, a cage or an aquarium. Uh -huh. If you set them in as an aquarium, they'll fill it full of water. And then uh, uh, if you can catch some of the fish in the game, you can throw them in there. Or like amphibian men or anything that can survive underwater can be put in those uh, aquariums as well. So you have like this 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 water box to use to to display your animals, which is which is pretty cool. Yeah, I don't think I've ever used a terrarium. So do you just place those down like a cage trap? Uh yeah. So uh, how the cage traps work is you just build a cage trap and uh -huh. then your dwarf will find a cage and put it in there. You can't specify what goes in there. So sometimes, so some of them will have just my normal cages. And some of them are going to have the terrariums. Unless I'm all exclusively building terrariums and I'm binning the other cages, there'll, there'll always be a mix in them. Interesting. So if we head up again once more, we get the kind of... We go to our surface area, because as I mentioned, I, I use the cavern as my surface. Um, yeah. I like that because you get like some interesting terrain gameplay, because you got to think about like, you know, how big the roofs are and where enemies are going to come from and stuff. So I, I find it, it ends up being a more interesting place to have your surface uh -huh. uh, as a bit of extra challenge but this is kind of the entrance where enemies have to enemies actually have to come in through this hatch and once they get down this hatch they go through this corridor here which is all uh, cage traps yeah and uh, usually unless uh there's a uh, multiple uh cavern or uh, dweller raids or like just a very very big goblin raid this should be enough to capture most everything in cages so it's very rare that anything can actually get passed into my 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 main base yeah uh over here this is the uh, exit of the hell corridor so anything that can survive and get you down here they end up down here as well so whether they're coming from the surface or they're coming from down below they'll always end up in this in the same area so that way i, I have to think about defending one front and having one 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 front ready yeah um we've got some fortifications here and uh, I've got a video about using Mark Stores on my YouTube, but uh -huh. basically I've got a bow here that I have for um, archers. And what I do is I tell my archers to defend uh, that bow. Uh -huh. And then they'll stand here right next to the fortification and they'll be able to shoot at anything that comes in through here. Um, so while with stuff like goblins and cavern dwellers, I can kind of rely on them to go down into the pit and get caught up and be fine. Uh, for um, forgotten beasts and uh, clowns or anything yeah. that that'd be a bit scarier, I um, uh, I'd have them come into this area. And right now, because of the bug, I can lock the doors. But in the future, you can see I actually have some some bridges getting built. Yeah. So I use I use bridges to seal them in there. And once they're sealed in, then my archers can pretty safely kill them and uh, and 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 take care of them while they're while they're sealed up in this area. Cool. Um, I think this, this one last little kind of defensive little trick I'll show here is you'll notice I've got um, a bunch of animals on on um, chains uh -huh. all over the place. So that's because when the Cavendellas attack you, they attack in ambush stance, so you can't see them. So you'll see down here we're actually currently being attacked by ant men right now. Oh yeah. And the only reason I the only reason I can see these ant men is because this puppy and this hunting dog uh, can see them through the fortifications. So they're telling me that I'm being under, I'm being attacked right now. If I didn't have these animals here, then um, I wouldn't know I'm being attacked until they got caught in the first cage trap. Right. And at that time, right. it's, it's too late. So, and you can actually see I've got them dotted all over the place. I've got a few here and there. These little, um, uh, these little guard posts just kind of keeping an eye so I can get a a, a nice early warning uh, for when they're being attacked. Mm-hmm. Oh wow! What are those creatures over there? I can see next to your unicorn. Uh, yeah, those. They're, oh, those are jatlers. Jatlers are really cool. Uh, so they are. Um, they're a very long, a very large cavern dweller. I believe they're like as big as an elephant. I think I'm not entirely sure. 
but they're really, really big. Um, they breed pretty fast. Uh, so they're good for like a grazing animal if you want to get access to a bunch of uh, meat and leather. I, uh -huh. I tend to breed them. And they're quite decent in combat because they're so big. And uh, the effectiveness of the animals in combat depends on their size. Yeah. So they're all big enough that they can actually defend themselves pretty well. Uh, the problem though is they eat a lot of grass. So I've got this big pasture that goes from, from this corner here all the way up to like this corner up here. Uh -huh. I can see there's a lot of this clay flooring. So uh, I'm kind of at the limit to how much grass they can eat. I might need to maybe expand up this way, capture some of this. But then if I do that, this area actually has a few Z levels of space above it. So I'd have to build up the walls and stuff, which yeah. kind of goes back to my... I was saying about how the, 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 the terrain is a lot more important than the cavern layer. And that's a kind of interesting gameplay. It's like, okay, I need to actually think about how do I approach this. This becomes a, 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 a bigger project than it would be in if it was, if it was just like a surface fort. Wow. Oh, and uh, would you... Oh, sorry, have you got anything... Have, any... Sorry, have, am I interrupting your fortress at all? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Uh, this is this is pretty much most of the of the of the uh, of of the of, of 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 the main things. Yeah, that's that's pretty cool. I also noticed a mist generator there as well. Yes. So I do have my mist generator. Um, so what I've actually done is, if I go back up here to the surface, uh, I've cut in through uh, here. I uh, passed the poor skeleton of Toulon. Yeah. And the pause down through here through the staircase that goes all the way down. And then on each layer, I've got these floor grates, and mm -hmm. it splashes and creates mist. Uh, and Voidcraft actually, he gets a nice window looking out at the at the um, uh, at, at the waterfall. Yeah. And it goes all the way down, then into this section here, and then I've got a couple of wells uh -huh. here that uh, pull it from this little underground river. Um, and then as well, I was using it to hit down a little bit further. I've got some uh, water generators down here uh -huh. that I used for making a um, for powering a pump stack, and I filled these up as well. These are connected uh, through this bridge to the um, to the same the same the, the, the same body of water. So that, uh, I was able to to, to 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 flood this area and create this little little little, little, yep. little power room. Nice. Oh wow! Okay. So. Um... Looking at your trap corridor, I imagine that there'll be some people who are um, fairly new to Dwarf Fortress who don't know how to set up a pressure plate to the spike traps or how to set up cage traps. Uh, I was wondering if you could talk us through how to do that. I'll, uh, I'll take drawbridges uh, when we go to my next fortress. Uh, but could you show us how to how to actually build a spike trap using a pressure yeah. plate? Yeah, sure. So you go here to your construction menu and under traps. And down here we've got the upright weapon spike trap. So you would uh, uh, plop this down and then you could set the put into it. You can put in spears or you can put in uh, uh, menacing spikes. Mm -hmm. I can put you can, you can put between one and ten of them into the trap depending on how how um how how lethal you want it to be. Uh, obviously, these are all tens. Um, <laughs> uh, once once you've built the spike trap and they've put stuff in it, it'll start it'll it'll be created like at this in this mode where all the spikes are currently up. Uh -huh. And at that point, if you want, you could have like a pit that will drop them onto the spikes to make to make uh, to make drops more 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 lethal. But if they just walk through it, they'll, 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 they'll be totally safe. Um, then, in order to set, to uh, to link it, you have to build a pressure plate. And you build the pressure plates again, it goes traps uh, pressure plates here. And you build it. Uh, when you build it, you actually have to set uh, what will trigger it. Uh -huh. um, and stuff like having minecarts and magma and water trigger it, this actually opens up the ability to have like um, really interesting automation. I can make like clocks and like kind of pretty like interesting computing stuff can be built using pressure plates and, and, the, and these options. Um, I think Twisted Logic Gaming has a recent video about that. Mm -hmm. But this is just very interesting stuff. But um, you can go to have creatures trigger it and then you can also set where the citizens will trigger it. Uh -huh. So these, these ones are not triggered by citizens. So my dwarves can go through here very safe while 
any creatures or any enemies that come in are going to be saying the traps off and making the spikes move 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 up and down. Mm-hmm. And you can also determine the weight of the creature that's going to set it off as well. So, like, maybe you don't want, like, you know, uh, small creatures setting off. Maybe you want, you, you want big, big creatures or whatever. You can, you can set that here as well. Uh-huh. And, yeah. And then once it's built, you just... You, you click on the plate, and there's this link plate option. Um, I think there's a limit of five per... So I think actually a lot of these might have hit their limit. Yeah, I think each each plate can be linked to five um uh to five uh traps. Yeah, I think I've got some plates over here though, two seconds. Let's head back to my uh base here. So I've got some other ones here that are that are activated by my citizens I was using for a different project. But uh -huh. um you can see here now when you link, when you click link plate, it's telling you which mechanisms will be used. Yeah. And then you just go back to uh, whichever, wherever your traps are. So that would be my, my hell corridor, which is up here. So I would just kind of click and then it creates this job to link a building to a trigger. And then your dwarf is going to put a mechanism into the pressure plate and the mechanism into the whatever I clicked. And from that point on, whenever the uh, pressure plate is um, uh, stood on, it will cause the trap to activate. And so the, I think it's worth pointing out to, um, to anyone who's unfamiliar with the spike traps, the spikes, the spikes themselves are indiscriminate killers, aren't they? It's the yeah. pressure plate that determines whether or not the spike trap is going to activate. So if you have a monster that is trap avoid, they'll avoid the pressure plate so if somebody else somewhere else within your fortress steps on a different pressure plate or that's linked to the spikes or pulls a lever that's linked to the spikes the spikes can still kill something even if it's trap avoid um gotcha okay and but then by the same token <laughs> uh if you set up uh, like further readings done in this corridor, um, the pressure plates within the corridor are not triggered by citizens. So if citizens come in to clean out the loot from the loot and the bodies from the traps, but if you then have another pressure plate that's linked from outside the corridor that is triggered by citizens, uh, the spikes will kill your own people as well. So. You need to be conscious of how who is going to be stepping on the spikes because it's when they're triggered, they will just kill whoever or whatever's there, whether it's your own people or whether it's um, monsters, and they can kill anything of any size. They're, uh, I believe, am I right with that further reading? They can, like, they can kill a forgotten beast, they can kill, like, if they're made out of steel they could kill a bronze colossus yeah they're very they, they, they do a lot of damage like a um uh, a normal goblin or a normal uh, uh like like cavern dweller can probably be killed by just a single activation while things that are bigger and tougher or wearing armor might take a couple a couple of activations like um for this corridor i don't think any goblins got through uh but a bunch of the ogres did get through they were they were they were very seriously wounded but they didn't manage to survive long enough to get through uh, only to get caught in my in my, in my cage shaft later. Yeah. But uh, yeah, yeah, it, it will it will do a a, a a a lot of damage to him. And if you can trap them in a corridor and have them walk up and down, <laughs> yeah. wandering up and down while you've got a dwarf outside with a lever on repeat or something like that, um, then uh, you can have both a lever, for as an example, you could have a lever outside and the pressure plate plates inside linked to yeah. the same trap so that you can activate them in two different ways yeah yeah exactly so it's a really versatile method we might put some of those in my fortress actually we could show setting some of those up because i've got corridors that really loan themselves to this um i'll show you mine in a second yeah uh, one thing i've been considering is um I think maybe having a one tile corridor might be too skinny. 
because sometimes I've noticed enemies have difficulty passing through it. What will happen is there'll be one enemy in front and one behind. Uh -huh. The one behind will move forward, push the one behind them, and then that guy will move and they'll swap places. So you get them kind of just swapping the, the same two places all the time, and it, it, it can stop them from moving and can make a siege last a lot longer than they should. Um, so I'm considering maybe in future I'd have it like a two tile wide corridor instead. Mm. Uh, it's a lot more expensive in terms of materials, but it means that um, the enemies will get through it faster, and that means you can just sort out the um, uh, the siege a lot a lot quicker. Uh huh. Interesting. I suppose that also let you uh, like stagger your pressure plates and your. Uh, spike traps as well. That way you have two different aisles that are activating at different times. Yeah, yeah. Cool. One, I, I actually do have two questions. Yeah. Uh, one of them is, one of them is uh, with the mechanisms for like the pressure plates and the traps. Is there a distance limit on that? Like, if how far away could I set set up a lever inside my fort? There's uh, no limit. Yeah. No limit at all. Okay. And then the other question I had was, uh, I noticed you were using quite a few ramps instead of like staircases. Is that a defensive option or is that a stylistic choice or what is that? Um, so in terms of this part here, uh, this is all ramps because um, uh, if they get wagons in a caravan, they can't go down staircases. So this okay. has to be ramps, otherwise I can't get, get them. Uh, while in other places I built them just because it made more sense. like. Um, yeah, I think I just, yeah, I, th I think it's more of a, a stylistic choice, like, where I don't really need them. But yeah, uh, uh, um, the only place you really, truly need ramps would be your main entrance. Make sure that the the, the, the wagons can get down to your, um, to, your, to, your, to your trade depot. Cool. Okay. And do you have any kind of gate that blocks off the trade depot, or...? Yeah, so this here is actually, this is a bridge here, uh, and this is linked to, I've got a bunch of levers here in my temple. So when I get attacked by the, from the surface, I can uh, pull this lever and that's going to close up access to the trade depot. And then I pull my funnel lever, uh, which is going to open up the, uh, the hell corridor. Uh, and, uh, and that lever is actually linked to both this bridge and this bridge down here. So they both open up. So now anything can go through this way and this will close up. And that way then when the enemies come down, they have to go down this way. And my fort is completely safe from anyone who might be a bit more cleverer and realize that, hey, the hell card was a bad idea, let's just go this way instead. Gotcha, okay. Cool, cool. All right, shall we switch back to my fortress and we'll look at some, some more passive ways of dealing with sieges. But I've got some corridors that could loan themselves to this. I'll show you how I've got that set up. Um, right, let's just move you, your fortress over there. And uh, so, yes, we're back in um, the fortress that we've seen on this stream a fair amount. And this is where we've got the uh, the model railway set up uh, by blind and it's the fortress where we did the pump stack with dan olsen uh, so a few of you will have seen this and you'll also have noticed if you have a look on the mini map i've got uh, a bizarre arrangement of tunnels and each of these tunnels are lined with drawbridges and there's all kinds of drawbridges and all kinds of tunnels all around the place. And this is my main entrance to the fortress. Uh, come see it. What I'm going to do, I'm going to let the game run because if we're really lucky, uh, we might actually get a raid <laughs> while, uh, while we're here because we're about due for a raid. So main entrance to the fortress is right over here in the far northeast corner. And to get down, they come down this ramp. Uh, the ramp is wide enough for wagons as well. Um, and through this corridor. Now I've got a bit like a, a rabbit warren. Sorry? Oh, sorry. I was uh, coughing. That's oh, bad. right. <laughs> Uh, I thought I turned my mic off, so... 
there's um i have two other entrances that i can open up but i usually just keep one of them open uh so ordinarily people things visitors i don't have many visitors in this fortress i also generally avoid visitors coming to the fortresses uh but wagons traders will come down this corridor here and then turn a corner here and head into here where i've got my trade depot so we've got a a few lines of defense first of all if i'm going to be doing anything with the drawbridges i've got doors here that i can lock to stop the dwarfs from wandering out um you never quite know when a, a dwarf will take a fancy to something in a corridor that's got a bunch of atom smashers running or something and then I've got my uh, a drawbridge when it's raised is indestructible. Nothing can destroy a drawbridge that's been raised. Now, a lot of creatures can destroy a drawbridge that's lowered, uh, which is worth bearing in mind. You can't use a drawbridge when it's on top of... Um, say a set of stairs or something like that or over the top of a ramp uh, they are destructible uh, when they're over the top of something so uh, but when they're raised when they're pulled and they're they're let's see so down here the drawbridges in my western corridor these ones here are raised so they are completely indestructible nothing uh, can get through here at all but i've got these other entrances set up oh hang on we got somebody in a strange mood i'll check that in a moment we should have everything he needs so yeah long corridors give me the chance to do something with uh potential invaders and then to keep an eye out for thieves and ambush predators i have dogs um near the entrance i found that having three dogs mean that it's highly unlikely that anything's going to sneak past them however if all three were stood to the side then something could pass by them the dogs something that sneaks or something that's very good at sneaking uh, will only be spotted by an animal if they're within one tile of the animal so yeah if these dogs all stand against this wall there is a very small likelihood that something could creep past but it would have to be i've only ever had that once in that was about six years ago <laughs> when uh, something managed to creep past three dogs in a corridor uh, they move around enough. So I haven't got mine chained. They're just in a pasture. Means I can get them out of harm's way pretty easy. And if we... Uh, if we got a siege... What I would do... So let's say it was... Um, we were sieged by the undead. That's the most likely thing that would siege us in this particular fortress. What I do is I raise um, the drawbridge on either side of my dogs. That way I don't need to worry about moving my dogs. And then I would open the drawbridges either side here. I've got both of these attached to a single lever because I, if I want this corridor opening, then generally I want both ends opening at the same time so I've got both of those bridges on a single lever uh, the undead would then walk through here and I'm I'm noting what you're saying about yeah I've seen them sort of they bob backwards and forwards a little bit in uh, a single tile corridor and I would probably be better opening this up a little bit wider and making that into a two tile corridor uh, so that the the enemies can pass a little faster because uh, this this corridor here isn't going to 
deal with the sieges. It's not going to help us. Um, this is just my dog bypass. Uh, and then these drawbridges here are connected to a lever. If I... Let's just keep everybody safe and I'll show... I'll give you a demonstration of how it works. Right, don't want anybody going outside. Actually, you can go to the trade depot. You're safe there. We'll pull the outer front door. Um, that's my outer front door lever. And I'll just make sure that nobody walks in the far northeast while I'm doing uh, tests. So these are my dogs. So we'll pull the dogs far, dogs near. Uh, then we'll open the northeast bypass. Okay, so we've got this drawbridge is now raised so that um, the dwarves can't get into this corridor. Oh, I've raised the... My... Yeah, wrong one. <laughs> Open that one. Um, I did dogs far. Dogs near. There we go. Okay, we'll lay that one down. We'll raise that one. So I've just got this one raised here because we could get uh, a human caravan coming in soon. But imagine that one's open. These ones are open. So the enemy would pass through here. And as long as it's something that we can crush. Now, my fortress is cut off. So there's nothing to... Um, because I've got this raised, that means that enemies can't path inside my fortress. So I've got a dog sat in a, a room here. Um, that is my bait dog to attract the enemies in. And he's quite happy sitting there in his... his Nice little room. Um, what we're going to do now is we're going to get the northeast crusher running and the east crusher running. And I'm going to put both of those on repeat. And what we'll see here, this pathway where things like the undead will come in. The drawbridges here will be raised and lowered. And they're fairly slow. But as long as something's not sprinting down these corridors... Um, we're pretty certain that they're going to get crushed by the drawbridges. And that's what a lot of these blood splatters are from. Just on these corners here, I've got some weapon traps. And that's mainly to deal with wild animals walking in. We've got a bit of a monkey problem in this fortress. Uh, monkeys try to path into the fortress. Sometimes the dogs will attack them. Um, if I see that a dog's been fighting a monkey, I'll usually call the dogs in and then just put my military in this corridor. Um, most of the monkeys will get taken out by the weapon traps on the corners. But yeah, you can see how uh, these bridges just going on repeat will... Uh, will kill almost anything. Could I link multiple levers to the same atom smashers to speed up the lever pulls? I could, um, but I've got them on separate levers for for adaptability. And because the kids will pull the levers, and I've usually got kids sitting around doing nothing. Um... I'll just cancel that now. Uh, 
and I'll open my base up again. Uh, we'll close the bypass again. And we'll open the front door again. Oh, and I just need to check that... Are you happy? You're happy. Okay, Fortress is all opened up again. In the process of becoming opened up. Right, bypass is closed, so any nothing can sneak past the dogs anymore. Now, some creatures are too big to be smashed by a drawbridge. Uh, so we need to bear in mind some of those bigger creatures. If we had a dragon come in or a... Um, or a titan or something like that uh, then these, if we tried to crush it with the drawbridge the drawbridge would just break into pieces so we can't uh, we can't crush large creatures which is why I've got a corridor here uh, this corridor's got cage traps in now a lot of creatures can get caught in a cage trap so goblins could walk through a lot of the undead will get caught in cage traps as well. Um, but I don't want to be dealing with lots of things in cage traps. Mostly I just want to crush them. Which is why I've got two corridors. One without cage traps and one with cage traps. And cage traps, these are passive cage traps. They're not linked to anything. Um, to put down a cage trap is really easy. You go to traps and then cage trap you place the cage trap I haven't got any oh I've not got any mechanisms because the door will still be closed down here is it oh probably because I'm out of mechanisms then um, I'll need some mechanisms making so that we can have a look at some spike traps um, I would like to, if we got anybody down the corridors, I just want to raise the drawbridge bridges back against the side. Uh, got a quick question for yeah. you. So what happens if you raise a drawbridge with something on it? Like, could you drop it in a pit or... If you raise a drawbridge and something's on it, they get catapulted, which can be anywhere between doesn't injure them, it just stuns them, through to outright kills them and there's just a smear of blood on your reef kind of thing. Um, okay. It's a bit variable what happens if somebody stood on a drawbridge um, when the drawbridge is raised. Which is why I've just locked these doors here to stop my dwarves wandering out while we stand these drawbridges up. So if a if one of those large creatures that cannot be crushed mm -hmm. were to stand on one of those drawbridges, would they just like bop their head on the ceiling or what would happen? It would just break the drawbridge because they're too heavy. Too heavy? Okay. Yeah. I'm just going to go down to my mechanics workshop. I'm going to tell you to make me some rock mechanisms. Use any rock, don't mind. Make 20 rock mechanisms. Uh, you've got some mechanisms. So we do have access to mechanisms. There's three in the workshop. Does mechanism quality or like what it's made out of change anything at all? It does for spike trap. Uh, actually, I'm not sure for spike traps. It does for weapon traps. So the weapon traps that I've got down here. Uh, this is a weapon trap. It's got uh, just one weapon in it. Uh, it's an artifact weapon. Can't remember what it was exactly. It's an iron mace, an artifact 
uh, I am Mace. And when you have weapon traps, they will occasionally jam. I don't know if the same is true of spike traps, but yeah, weapon traps can jam. The more weapons you have in a weapon trap, the more damage those weapons will do, but the more likely they are to jam. But the better the quality of mechanism, the less likely they are to jam. Um, gotcha, okay. I don't know, further reading, have you ever seen a spike trap jam? Um, I haven't seen them jam in this fortress, but I've, al I've already actually had one siege from the surface. So I'm not sure if, if, mm. if my sample size is big enough, but um, as far as I know, I think I'm, I think I saw someone say on Reddit, or maybe I saw it on the wiki, that um, it's only weapon traps can 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 jam. I, I'm I'm 90, 99 yeah. percent sure that only weapon traps. Yeah, that's that's the only one I'm aware of that can jam. But I I can't say with an air of authority that nothing else can jam. But I think it's only the weapon traps that jam. <laughs> Chat saying it looks like strawberry jam. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so we've got a way to deal with the masses. The goblins can get crushed by drawbridges. The undead can get crushed by drawbridges. Um, we're dealing with sneaks and ambushes using our dogs. They can detect them, and they'll. Uh, the war trains, so they can put up a bit of a fight as well. We've got a way to bypass the dogs and protect the dogs. And then for a lot of creatures which are too large to be crushed by my drawbridges, we can catch those in cages. But there are some creatures that are too large to be crushed by a drawbridge and are also trap avoid, so won't get caught by a cage. And for surface creatures, the main problem is titans. So titans can be, they can be very hard to deal with. And some of them can be quite tough. So in a previous fortress, I had a titan come into the fortress that were, it was only made out of water, should have been nice and easy to kill. Uh, but it was a web spitter. And... If you get an enemy that spits webs, they, they're probably the, probably the, oh, every dwarf fortress's nemesis because web spitters, they're really good. If you can get them trapped, um, get them held somewhere, you can use them to farm silk. But when you're fighting them, if you, especially if you've only got melee forces, then web spitters are extremely hard to deal with because they will cast multiple webs all at the same time and your soldiers doesn't matter how good your soldiers are they'll get trapped in the webs and pinned to the floor and often killed before they even get a single blow so yeah that's that's pretty pretty difficult to to deal with web spitters so what i've got for dealing with things like titans um what i would do is i would close off my dogs open the bypass corridor and uh, now if i was to let it come through here it wouldn't even get caught by the weapon trap not unless it was dodging something so they can get caught in a cage trap or a weapon trap if they're trying to fight something and they dodge now the same goes with your dwarfs so our dwarfs know these weapon traps are there and are not going to uh, get caught by it but if they're fighting something and they dodge onto a weapon trap they can get injured uh, so what I would do, this is why I've got various other drawbridges in various other places. I would try and get the Titan down into the corridor. I don't want it getting to the dog because it would kill a dog. Um, which is why I've got a, a dog door there. So we can, as soon as it gets inside, what I would do is pull my dog door and pull my... Uh, external door 
so that we've got it trapped in the corridors. And then I would open one of these little narrow corridors here. These are my Titan corridors. They're very long. The idea of the length of the corridor is that Titans can move quite quickly. So having a long corridor gives me the chance to use the variety of different bridges and dog setups that I've got to coax a Titan into one of these corridors and then I can hold it there. And uh, If it's a web spitter, I would be able to smooth so i'd be able to dig out to this corridor and smooth some fortifications and attract the like maybe here i could i've got some wall here where i had some valuable gems that i dug out um i could remove a bit of wall here we could smooth along here and position some dogs here so that the titan had spit webs at it and we could farm it for silk um and then what I would normally do uh, without spike traps, what I would do is hold the Titan in the corridor until I need it. So if I need somebody to come and... Um, if I need some really strong muscle, Let's say we've got a second Titan comes on the map, because I've had that before. <laughs> Several Titans walking into the same area. I can then release my first Titan to fight the second Titan. Um, if I get something that I don't want to deal with, let's say we've got a weird beast trapped in a cage. So with weird beasts, Weird beasts are trap avoid, but once they turn back into their um, their original form, their original form are not trap avoid. So I have had weird beasts uh, walk in along a trap cor a corridor that has cage traps, and then convert back and run back out through the cage traps again. So if I've got a corridor that have where I haven't got the crushers set up yet uh, but I've got the cage trap set up we can as long as we hold the weir beast in the corridor until it turns back it will get caught in the cage traps uh, so every so now and then I do get a fortress where I've got a weir beast in a cage trap and uh, what I would then do is let's say we've got a, a titan caught in this corridor I would put the weir beast um, in a different corridor. I would go and install the cage. Uh, what we do, I just haven't got any in these cage traps to show you how to do this, but um, if I did, if you've got something in a cage that you want to move somewhere, you build the cage and you build the cage that has the thing in it. Do I have anything in cages? No, if we had some, if we had a cage that had a thing in it, uh, it would come up on, on the list of cages. It'd say, pine cage, weir beast. And then we'd build the weir beast cage. Uh, and then we'd link that cage to a lever. So I'd have it down in this corridor. Uh, then I'd link the cage to a lever and put the lever somewhere safe inside the fortress. Um, and then I'd raise these, these two bridges. I'd lower the bridge that connects the Titan to the Weir Beast. Um, and then I'd pull the lever that lets the Weir Beast out of its cage. Uh, and then I'd let those two duke it out. And then I would go from having two problem monsters to having just one problem monster. And uh, and that's why all of these narrow corridors uh, connect to each other. So I only ever have one problem monster uh, locked in the walls. If I get two, they'll two will soon become one. 
But yeah, what we can do is um, set up one of these corridors with a bunch of spike traps. Uh, I think that would be a good idea. I should really have that bypass raised as well. Right, so if I open up... I think we'll use this one here. What are the uh, numbers you have? Ah, <laughs> so... If I decided that I wanted to get my military doing some fighting, um, then what I would do is bring them down this corridor because it's the longest of the corridors. So let's say we've got a goblin siege. When goblins uh, move down into a corridor, they tend to move in formation and they will come down here they move goblins move quite slowly and they move in a long string so i would let them start walking through and then as they started getting down to probably about here yeah i'd um, as they started to approach door number seven i would pull this drawbridge and then I'd start pulling all of the other drawbridges and that would set that would trap them into little pockets. So I would end up with some of the goblins would be trapped here, some would be trapped here, some in this pocket, some in that pocket, some in this pocket. And there'd be small pockets of goblins. Uh, same with the elves if elves attack. A lot of the time they will just sit on the surface to ambush you um, but sometimes they will when they come down they tend to bring lots of animals with them and they will funnel down in formation and you can split them up into small groups so what I would do then is I would have my military um, positioned probably about here and then I'd just lower gate number seven and I'd let the enemy come round the corner and let my military deal with pocket number one. Um, and then once once this area, the uh, whoever's been caught between gate number six and seven, once we've dealt with all of them, I'd get rid of the corpses so we don't have to deal with miasma. Um, I'd let any injured soldiers get treated. Uh, then I'd come back up, position my soldiers here, and we'd open gate number six. And then we'd deal with whoever was trapped in this area. So by having all of these, uh, a long corridor with several interim drawbridges, I'm able to make sure that we don't have to deal with overwhelming numbers even if we're being attacked by hundreds, um, we'll be able to split them off into pockets of sometimes three and four, sometimes maybe 20. Okay. And the, the numbers are to tell me which lever to pull. <laughs> oh, okay. That makes sense. So why would you actually fight them one group at a time instead of just dropping the drawbridge on them? So when we drop the drawbridge on them, it destroys the bodies, which is a good thing, but it also destroys the loot, which is a bad thing. Ah, okay. Usually, I destroy the body, in this fortress at least, I'm quite happy to destroy the bodies and the loot, because we've got huge quantities of iron, huge quantities of flux, so I can make as much steel as I want. Uh, there isn't really anything that I need off the enemies. But if I had a fortress where I was short on iron or flux, or I didn't have a source of carbon to make steel, I might want to make sure that I catch some enemies uh, so that I can take their loot off them. Yeah, um, uh, that's the situation actually in, in my fort at the moment. I've got no access to flux stone. Ah. Um, uh, but luckily, the Ant-Men, because they've got four arms, they carry with them one <laughs> weapon and three shields, so I get a lot of metal out of them. Okay. 
Are they carrying anything decent? Huh? Or is it just iron? Or do they have uh, steel they, stuff? They will sometimes, they'll have a mix of copper, bronze and steel. Uh, usually, each ant will have at least one uh, steel item. At least uh, so, so far, that's, that's that's been the case. That's, uh, I still find it hilarious that the, the ant men come with, like, multiple shields. Yeah, <laughs> It was, it was quite funny early on because they had so many shields that my marks dwarves couldn't hit them. And I was trying to make a plan for training where I would leave one have his shields, i tie them up to a chain, and then my dwarves would shoot at them. And because they wouldn't hit, they keep them alive and get, keep training and training. Um, <laughs> but they got too good too fast and they just start killing them. <laughs> I've got this image of like the, the Ant-Man just like constantly holding up different shields with different hands blocking them. That's bizarre. Uh, things that you, things you don't think about, except in Dwarf Fortress, multiple shields. Um, yeah, but I think what we'll do is we'll set up one of the corridors, one of my Titan traps. Um, we'll put down a bunch of spike traps. Let's see. Yeah, we've got a little bit of time. We can do that. I'm just wondering, actually, which is the best of these narrow corridors to use. Uh, I might do this one because it's nice and easy to break through. So if I just remove those walls there, uh, we can put down a bunch of spikes here. Right, dwarfs, onwards. Let's make sure that I'm open for traders. See this, uh, this corridor is secure. We've got the drawbridges raised. Yep, we're open for traders. The bypass corridors are closed. Titan corridors are closed. All the drawbridges are raised. Dwarfs can get in and out. Okay. Right, let's uh, let's build some spikes. So traps, upright weapons spike trap. We'll start there. In fact, I've got some spare weapons, some spare artifact weapons. I think I'll put down. Actually, I know I've only got three. Um, uh, yeah, I'll put all three artifacts in there. I know, if, I think I've only got three mechanisms at the moment. Just have a quick look at my stock screen. Yeah, I've only got three mechanisms available. So I'll just put one down for the moment. And since as this is a fortress of levers, I'll attach it to a lever. So levers are under machines. We'll build a lever. We need a mechanism for that. <laughs> and Tekkad, Tekkad's going to be on one of our uh, streams soon. Um, is commenting on how hard we go on security. <laughs> Tekkad's fortresses, it just tends to stab them a lot. <laughs> really hard and a lot. Yeah, 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 but this is a stream all about how to protect your fort, how to keep your fortress safe. And we are looking at how to do that passively using traps and things. I should also show people how to build a drawbridge as well. Uh, if you want to build a drawbridge, then it's under construction and bridge. Now you've got four different... You need to set the direction... <coughs> as, oh, sorry. Bless you. <laughs> uh, four different ways to set up a drawbridge. You can have it so that it will, when it raises, 
it raises to the uh, to the west so if I put it here it would raise to the west and it would raise up against this door here so if I put a drawbridge here and raised it to the west oh, summertime uh, it would block off that doorway then we've got race to the south, race to the north, and race to the east. And then this one is retract. So when you pull the lever to retract, the drawbridge disappears. Um, so you can't use a retracting drawbridge to crush anything, but you can use it to drop enemies into a pit and you can have uh you can have pits that are really deep and you can have drawbridges that are really long and you can do retracting drawbridges on a repeating cycle you just need the drawbridge to be extended for long enough for enemies to try and walk on it you want to set up minecart grinders in your next fortress yeah <laughs> what is a minecart grinder? Uh, so with minecarts, if you set them up right, you can have them so they go in a circle and never stop. Um, and then you make that the path into your base, so enemies will path through it. And if the cart is going fast enough, it just bumps into them and kills them. Oh, okay. Yeah, minecarts can be quite deadly. <laughs> Could you also use that for, like, automatically moving stuff around your fort, by any chance? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's that... that's that, that, that's how you're supposed to do it. Oh, okay. That's the, the primary purpose. <laughs> um, well, in that case, you could probably kill two birds with one stone. With a, a grinder, you would normally have it going in a circle to make sure that... Uh, and have it so it's constantly speeding up and speeding up and speeding up. Um, they then also become very dangerous for your own dwarves as well. <laughs> so, oh, okay. yeah. Um, but uh, they, they certainly serve both purposes. I just want to show how long a drawbridge you can make. So I think it's 31. Now this would be a retracting drawbridge. And if I say, sure, use chirp blocks. Um, so if there was a pit under here, um, we got something to path over it and then pull the lever, uh, the this drawbridge would just disappear. I don't actually want them to build that there. Uh, and the thing would drop down. Uh, whatever stood on the drawbridge would drop down uh, below. Uh, but yeah, I'm going to let them build that weapon trap. I best just check on this uh, strange move guy. Right, he's not there. He's collecting stuff. Right, let's let them build this weapon trap. Oh, so if you drop something down a pit uh you know it would die from fall damage would that also destroy the body and the loot or no if something dies from fall damage uh then the you might damage some of the loot if they're wearing clothes it'll probably tatter their clothes um it will probably dent their armor beyond use but you can still smelt the armor okay so you can recover the metal from anything that they've got uh, the body will still be there. It might be in a few bits. So you might have uh, something like the intestines in a slightly different place to the rest of the body. Some stuff kind of out of order. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> yeah, not Dosha approved. <laughs> Dwarven Osha. There's uh, a lot of things in fortresses which are um, dangerous to dwarves. So it always feels very dwarfy to have traps and devices uh, to deal with enemies rather than um, just straight up fighting them. 
feels very human to fight. It feels more dwarvy to use devices. At least to me, anyway. Okay, dwarves are working on it. Um, let me make sure I've got a few mechanics. Yeah, I've got a few mechanics. Good. Sometimes I restrict it just to... Like, if all I'm doing is just making mechanisms, I'll restrict it to just my best mechanic. But yeah, if I'm building traps, we can have more than one. Have somebody making mechanisms and somebody loading the trap. So what have we got there so far? We've got two of the weapons. We've got the lever set up. So yeah, dwarven levers, they work by uh, by Wi-Fi. <laughs> we decided. Um, to connect something from a lever to a drawbridge or a cage or, uh, or a door or a hatch or a floodgate. Um, the levers are really, really um, versatile. That's the word. So if I wanted to link a lever, uh, all I've got to do is click a building to link to the lever. And we can't link it to a workshop. We can't link it to a table. Those cages are not installed. We can link it to a drawbridge. We can link it to a door. I'm looking at the, the message here. Uh, what else have we got around the place? Does linking it to a door automatically block the door if you yeah. click the lever? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. So, I think there's a limit of... I'm not sure if it's 5 or 10 for a lever. Uh, but there's, there's a, there is a limit... Ah, pig iron mace. Uh, thank you, Azura. Um, yeah, there's there's a limit to how many things you can link, but you could link. Can we link to a cage trap? Not to a cage trap because they're passive. Um, yeah, I know for I know for pressure plates it's uh, a limit of five, and I think it's the same for levers. But uh, is I'm it? One hundred percent sure. We can link to gear assemblies. Uh, we can link to track stops. So you can activate and make, you can make track stops active or inactive. Uh, what exactly does that do? That would disable the track stop so that um, the, the minecart wouldn't use the, wouldn't use the, uh, the stop. It's the only way, how can I describe that better? As yeah, in, it wouldn't um, turn into there, or it would just keep going through the stop? So further reading was just about to say something? Yeah, so usually okay. with a track stop, you said to dump items when it gets there. So it won't dump items if it hits it. And then, yeah, if you have one that's in the middle of a track, uh, it won't stop on it. It'll keep going past as as the... Uh, as it as, as as it goes by because uh, sometimes you might you might set them down like a drop and after take stuff out and kick it or whatever but it'll it'll keep going if 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 if, if it has the mo if it has the um uh the speed okay okay so i've just linked uh, i've clicked on the spike trap because they've got the spikes in there now And it will take two mechanisms. They'll need to put a mechanism in the spikes and a mechanism in the lever. So they're working on that now. We'll see them put a mechanism in the spike first. They've got to have access to both the lever and the device to be able to connect those two up. But uh, yeah, the levers or pressure plates, um, to use those two things as triggers and to link them to spike traps um, or drawbridges, 
uh, it, it's really, really simple. <laughs> I've been coaching uh, Honey Play in how to play Dwarf Fortress, and uh, she's uh, she's a, a streamer. Um, she's the the wife of uh, Packraft um, from Minecraft, and uh, she's never played any colony management, but she plays a lot of Minecraft, uh, and she's she. How did she describe herself? I think it was as completely incompetent with redstone. So when I started talking about how we were going to set up some devices, and pretty early on as well in her experience with Dwarf Fortress, she was like, um, this sounds complicated. But uh, yeah, she's she's setting up drawbridges all over the place, no problem at all. She understands that, like how the Wi-Fi works, just how easy it is. Uh, link that thing to that thing, and as long as you've got some mechanisms, uh, really easy. Right, let's put that wall back. And there we go, that's how easy it is to uh, to build a, a spike trap. Simple enough. Indeed. So I'm going to have to redo my entire fortress that I'm working on right now. Because I'm only like <laughs> two layers down uh, with my main floor. So I'll have to reroute everything to be deeper. <laughs> Right, oops, just went up a level. So I've just put that lever on to repeat. So really what we would want to do. There we go. So every time they pull the lever, it's going to activate that spike trap. So one thing that people often do, uh, if you want to put a lever on repeat, is uh, you put down the pressure plate somewhere where you've like in an animal room <laughs> where you've got an animal that's walking across a lot or you'll cage a, um chain an animal in a small area um or have something like a little two by two room with a chicken in it is quite a common one with a pressure plate at one side so as the chicken just paths up and down because it's um it's only got two tiles it can move between. It's going to activate the pressure plate every time it moves. And yeah, if we look at these guys, you can see that they're they're moving around fairly regularly. So yeah, something like a, a pig, because they they'll move to root up some grubs from the ground. Um, pigs and birds don't need to be fed underground, so yeah, it's just putting um, a pressure plate down. We probably need mechanisms for a pressure plate. Uh, no, we don't actually. Okay, we would want... Uh, wrong one. Creatures trigger. No, I need a mechanism first. Yeah, need my guys to make some mechanisms. But yeah, that's another way to do it. Put a, a pressure plate in a room with some animals. And the animals will walk on and off the pressure plate. Uh, it's more controllable if you've got a, a one by two corridor. Just a little tiny room that is... Um, that kind of size. Uh, with, um, with an animal walled inside it, or even just with the door on it, uh, with a pressure plate at one end and the animal in a pasture, um, in the other, uh, held within that one by two area, just walled in, door on it, um, and yeah, that'll keep the animal walking backwards and forwards over the pressure plate, which will keep your spike trap, um, operational. But at the moment, I think the kids are playing with it. So if you were to set up a pressure plate like that, mm -hmm. is there a way you could like enable or disable the pressure plate itself? 
That uh, way it's yeah. not constantly going? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it would... Will you just like have a separate lever going to it? Uh, no, you'd be able to go to... I haven't got a pressure plate to show you, but... Um, in the same way as the spike trap here, um, I can disable the uh, the command to pull the lever. On the pressure plate, um, what we can do is tell them... We can switch what triggers the pressure plate. So... Yeah, there's there's always with the triggers. There's always something where you can switch on. In fact, I should let further reading answer that one because he uses them so often. Yeah. So for pressure plates, so once you've built them, you can't turn them off. As far as I know, I think maybe oh. maybe if you forbid it, it's. I'm not sure actually if you forbid it, it stops. But as far as I'm aware, maybe someone in chat might know for sure. But as far as I'm aware, once the pressure plate is linked to something, that's what it'll keep activating it. Uh, so you want to make sure that if you are linking it to like a spike trap or whatever, that once it's linked, your dwarves are never going to that area because it'll always be going. Uh, uh, it'll, it'll always be going. I guess you'd, if you have like a an animal uh, turning it off and on, you could maybe move the animal out of the room and put the animal in the room when you need it or, 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 or something like that instead. Oh, so you can't change what triggers it afterwards? After no, you, yeah, like, oh. yeah, like, I, I, I know for sure that you can't change the trigger, but in terms of making it completely disabled, I'm ninety nine percent sure that you can't even disable it once it's built. It'll, it'll always be be activated. You, you, you need to actually, um, uh, you, I, I, yeah, like, I'm looking here at my, uh, pressure plate in game, and I, yeah, um, I, I think, yeah, like, I, I can, uh, let's see. Do -do -do. Yeah, like, uh, um, based off the tooltip, I'm not sure if forbidding the mechanisms is actually doing anything. Um, and yeah, and there's, there's no option here to actually change the, uh, the the triggers. Ah, so you'd have to uninstall it, like say, or if yeah. it's triggered by an animal, take the animal out. Yeah, yeah. Uh huh. Okay. So the benefits of the levers are that you can stop it from activating uh, a little easier. But yeah, moving an animal out of it. Um, or changing the pasture zone as well. Um, so if we if we had an animal in a pasture, if that room that it was contained in uh, was a two by three, say uh, a one by three, and we had uh, the pressure plate at the end. Let's put the pen pasture uh, across the pressure plate to start with. It's not going to show up very well against the blue. There we go. But uh, yeah, so at the moment the animal would be in the top two. If we wanted the animal to be in the bottom two, then we could extend it to there and remove it from the top. Uh, somebody would still come and pet the animal <laughs> to let the animal know that it now belongs in the bottom two. But you could have a doorway in between so that uh, as the animal goes to explore the third square, you just lock it out. That's... You could do something like that uh, to make it easier just to move the animal backwards and forwards. Just extend the um because doorways yeah i think i'd probably use doorways to do it because you could even have um a setup let me find somewhere where we've got a bit of a clearer space yeah i've got ideas on this now So, um, Unek and chat is suggesting to use minecarts to activate the pressure plates. Oh yeah, and you can do you that can too. you control them by just taking the minecart away. That's, that's, that's actually... That's, that's a good that's, idea, good yeah, idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's fantastic. I suppose you could actually make a clock with that just by having the cart go in a circle. Yeah, I've done that in the past. Um, to, um, instead of having somebody pulling a lever to make my crushers work, I've had someone pull a lever to trigger a minecart, mine which would then go round and round in a circle. 
uh, you've got to, with something like the minecart going over a pressure plate, if the pressure plate is going to trigger a drawbridge, there's a, the drawbridge needs enough time to lower and enough time to raise. So you've got to get your minecart tracks length, the right length, um, so that it triggers it at the right time. I think from memory, I think it was something like 400 ticks you needed, or it might have been a 400 length minecart track. I can't quite remember. It was quite a long track. I needed it to go around to do um, a repeat on the drawbridge. Um, but yeah, what I'm thinking here is I would do... something like a door there oh i haven't got my keep building on a door there and a door there uh i'd have that walled in uh just use closest on that And then I would have a pen pasture over the pressure plate. And then I'd have a meeting area outside. Because if animals are not in a... In fact, you know, you could do it with meeting areas for both. Yeah. Okay, this would this would mean that the dwarves didn't have to. Uh, the dwarves themselves wouldn't have to get involved then. So if the pressure plate is here, we'll mark the pressure plate since I don't have any mechanisms. We'll mark the pressure plate as that blue square. Um. Then if I wanted the animal to walk backwards and forwards over the pressure plate. I would suspend that meeting area because if animals have got nowhere to go, they path to a meeting area. Um, and then this door I keep locked so that the animal's always in one of these two areas. Um, I'd probably keep the middle one locked until I wanted them to move. Uh, then if I wanted them away from the pressure plate, I would activate that one and suspend that one. So the animal would move through into here and then I could lock the door behind it to make sure it doesn't wander out onto the pressure plate. Um, Simple enough. Yeah, that would that means that the dwarves don't have to get involved then in moving the, uh, the animals around. Huh. <laughs> oh, there you <laughs> go. Just, yeah, I uh, kind of like that, actually. I might try that in one of my... Uh, current fortresses. Right, I don't actually want them to build all of this because I haven't got anything to link it to yet. Um, but I, yeah, I can see me using that. Right, let's just deconstruct that. Well, we're, time has flown by today. Uh, yes, it has. <laughs> we are, we're actually coming to the end of the stream. Um, so I'll say, chat, do you have any further questions, um, while we answer, and, um, uh, before we leave, and, uh, further reading, and Lou, anything, any questions, anything that you want to add before we leave? Uh, questions. I did have a question about the cage traps. Yeah. So, w I know if you just use a cage trap, it drops and the animal is suddenly in a cage do you have to take care of anything that is in a cage or is it just kind of in stasis can it break out can it does it starve does it need anything like that i thought that nothing could break out of a cage trap but I believe a uh, scoundrel was telling me that he had a problem where he was using wooden cages because wooden cages are the lightest. Um, you'll see most of my cages are made out of wood. I've bought them from the elves. Um, ooh, okay, there's a lot there. 
Um, yeah, he was catching something down in the uh, down near the magma. Um, he was catching things in cages, and they were setting fire to the cages. That maybe they were shooting at things, and the cages caught fire, rather than being actually in the cage. So that's true. If you get something like a dragon, uh, a dragon will quite happily walk into a wooden cage, and that's it. It's trapped. It can't get out. But if the dragon is um, wandering down this corridor, sees a dwarf or a dog or something, and uh, blows fire at the dog or the, the dwarf then it'll burn all of the cage traps and destroy them before it gets to them uh, oh, but otherwise okay. it would just walk yeah. through them uh, yeah. so it, it wouldn't see the the traps there it wouldn't know that the traps are there to shoot fire at them um, once it's walked in them you're safe uh, but yeah if it if it just happens to catch things in its uh, in its fiery breath then it'll destroy all the things. Um, yeah, uh, there is a uh, a tag called gnar that in theory should allow some animals to eat through a wood cage, but it's not working properly right now. Um, uh, I think at some point when that's fixed, then wooden cages will become less reliable. But yeah, uh, as of right now, nothing can break out unless the cage itself gets destroyed. Aha, uh -huh. so something like a giant rat might be able to gnaw through uh, a wooden cage. Okay. I've never known that to, to work, so I don't know how. I'm guessing that's been broken for a while. <laughs> uh, yeah, as far as I know, pretty much the entire time it's been broken. Um, right. <laughs> and yeah, and yeah, people in chat are saying that grazers yeah, will grazers starve in cages. Starve. Uh, another, thing that's, uh, another funny effect with cages is um, if an animal is pregnant and gets caught, it will give birth inside the cage. Yeah. And you have a ton of animals inside one cage, which is pretty, pretty funny. Mm -hmm. Um uh, and uh, I think there are some rumours that animals can get pregnant if the cages are next to each other, but I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure. One thing okay. to be aware of is in certain biomes you can get mischievous vermin creatures, um, like gremlins. Mm -hmm. I once had a giant cave spider uh, in a cage, and it was pregnant and it gave birth to three baby cave spiders three baby Ooh. giant cave spiders um and then a gremlin came along and just let them all out oh that's fun <laughs> yeah quite yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there's, there's also a whole a whole process in trying to safely empty your cages so you, you yeah. may have seen in my in my fort i've got uh the cages suspended over lava um there's it, it's a whole complicated process to make sure you can do that correctly without the prisoners are freaking out and escaping. Uh, but if you set it up properly, you can safely just drop them through hatches and they'll either die from fall damage or they can die from lava. Or you can have like a big a big fighting arena down there that they'll fight each other or your dwarves. Yeah. So you're okay to pick up a cage and build it somewhere. Um, that you're perfectly safe picking up a cage and building it. Um, and if you've got an animal in a cage that you want to move to a stockpile somewhere, that's what the animal stockpile is for. So if we put down a stockpile, uh, we've got a space there, and we turn it into an animal stockpile. Um, I don't want you moving empty, uh, any empty cages there, but any cages that have got people or things in them, uh, would now get moved to that stockpile. They're fine picking up the cages and putting them in a stockpile. They're fine taking them and building them. Um, and building the cage with the animal in. Um, they're fine linking a mechanism to that and releasing whatever's in the cage at a distance using uh, a lever and Wi-Fi. Um, but yeah, if you dump them or or try to sell them to a trader, bad things <laughs> can happen. Yeah, it's a whole process, like you say, to uh, to safely remove things from. Um, I did. It was what 
in the last version, the pre-Steam version, I did an experiment where I had goblins in cages and I was releasing them down a pit to see how many of the goblins would end up in the pit and how many would escape from the pit before rather than fall. And it was about 50-50. About 50% of them ended up down in the pit and about 50% of them ended up on the cliffside uh, fighting my, my soldiers. Yeah, like I, I found um, they tend to get free if either the dwarf leading them gets spooked or if they get spooked. Uh, and so and one way I found that can be quite reliable is to make sure the drop is big enough that they can't really see and understand what's happening at the other side of the hatch. Um, I've been able to pit like 50 plus goblins at once without anyone escaping. Um, and another issue I've noticed as well is if there's animals, like if you have your stray animals in the area mm -hmm. and if the door is open and they can see that you've taken something out, then they'll attack and that will freak out the prisoner and cause them to escape. Uh -huh. mm. Interesting. So good tips there. Right, but I think we're just about done here, aren't we? Sounds like it. Indeed. Like I said, I'm going to have to redo my entire fort to be properly trapped. <laughs> I, I'm only a couple layers down, so I have to rearrange everything. <laughs> uh, it's You know you're doing well in Dwarf Fortress when... Oh, that you're getting into it. When every time you start a fortress, you come up with new ideas of how you want your next fortress to be. That's a really good sign. <laughs> That's, um, it's, yeah, if you think, I don't want my fortress to look like this. I want my fortress, I've got better ideas. I've got different layouts I want to use. That's when you know that you're, you're really getting into the game. <laughs> it's a, a really good sign. Uh, right, well. Thank you both for the reading and Buffalo for joining me. Would you, uh, just to remind everybody, uh, further reading, you are, uh, how often do you stream? Um, I stream either three or four days a week. It depends on when I get my, my videos done. So I do a video every week. Uh, and if I get that done in time, I'll stream Monday, Tuesday, Friday and Saturday. If I don't, I'll just stream Tuesday, um, uh, Friday and Saturday. And in fact, next Tuesday is my birthday, Ooh, and I'm going to have a, some, some fancy, some fancy fun, fun stream on Tuesday to celebrate that. <laughs> and what time That's do fun. you normally stream? Uh, I'll start my stream at around uh, seven o'clock UTC, and I'd finish it at around midnight UTC. Oh, lovely! And uh, 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 and Lou, how often do you put out videos? Where can people find you? So I'm primarily on YouTube, uh, and I'll actually stream on YouTube on rare occasion as well. Uh -huh. But uh, I try to get a video out once a week, either on a Friday or a Saturday, around 5 p.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time. Fabulous. Right, well, we shall say goodbye here. Thank you both for joining me. It's been a delight. It's always nice to look at uh, devices and traps and... And thank you so much for the reading for your fortress tour. You've given me some ideas for sure. <laughs> I'll be redesigning a few things. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll, I'll certainly be coming and hanging out in some of your streams because you usually stream as I'm setting up my stream. So I, I'm usually lurking around in streams at the time that, uh, that you're live. So I'll certainly be hanging out in some of your streams. So thank you for joining me. Uh, let's go find somebody to raid. <laughs>